Patrick and Joe Edwards. Um, they are from a firm just here on here in Muncie, towards um, Newport Ball State, on the northern side. And I'm gonna turn it over, and we're gonna start here with Joe. Okay. And did you get us started? I did. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. We might uh, we're here from B Step Doctor and Company, which is a we're a regional firm here located here in Muncie. Um, so our scope is kind of we like to say maybe a hundred miles draw a circle around Muncie and that's kind of in the area where we operate. So uh, my name is Joe Edwards, this is Maggie Kirkpatrick Sakura. I thought maybe we'd introduce ourselves, tell tell you guys a little bit about us before we get going today. Um, do you want to go ahead and start with that? Yeah, um, I was actually a non traditional student. Graduated from high school, uh, wasn't going to go to college, actually, uh, and then started into college and uh, at the age of 35 graduated from Ball State University. Um, I um, actually was, took my job with Blue Company in Indianapolis. Um, you get hired a year in advance through public accounting. And uh, the day the employment contract came, we set doctor and company call. Local firms have a tendency to get a lower pay when they're looking for hires. And uh, went in and interviewed and decided that 750 hours on the road over here was something I didn't want to do when you had children and a middle school and high school. And decided to stay in my state. And uh, the other thing that I like about staying in town here was most firms will uh, shoot you in to auditing. And I was, of course, a little older. And I wanted that life balance, a little more balance to be able to my children's functions and do things. So I went ahead and uh, the local firm gave me the all around experience. So you do payroll, you do write up work, you do tax returns. So you got a lot more wide range of experience than if I went to uh, Lewis Company was going to put me in the tax area, tax firm. That's what I specialize in, uh, and also business consulting. I do trust in the state, to all things. So uh, and international tax. So I kind of branched out in the areas I like. Um, it's just everybody in our firm is different. Everybody has different. Um, you'll notice that I'm a CITP, that's a Certified Information Technology Professional, so that means I have experience with computer systems uh, and network software. So I have an extra specialty area with the CPA um, so that I can do some extra things. Sure. So, uh, like I said earlier, my name is Joe Edwards. Uh, I'm a senior accountant with these type doctors. So, to give you a little bit of perspective, Maggie's a principal with, with the firm, so she's considered a partner, I guess, in terms of the hierarchy, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but I'm, I'm a senior accountant. I've been with these type now for almost three years. Uh, I started at a, a, a larger regional firm in Indianapolis called Crow for I was there for about a year, year and a half. Time frame, um, and, and like Maggie spoke to the idea of getting uh, put into one area. That's that's exactly what happened to me um, in my large firm experience. I was there. Um, they put me in, into a healthcare consulting role, so I wasn't doing tax or audit. I was doing more uh, consulting with large hospitals, looking at their accounts receivable, trying to predict when they were going to be paid. So, um, long story short, it, I was really locked into one area. That didn't appeal to me. Um, I was living here in Muncie and Community, so um, I had the opportunity to interview with East Tech Doctor, and, and that's worked out great uh, to this point. So, um, and, and just like Maggie said, when, when I started the same experience, um, I, I started doing payroll, write up work, audit, tax, um, a wide variety of, of topics and things that, that I'm working with. Um, and now I'm beginning to start to specialize, as she talked about as well. Um, so I've got the CBA there, that's a, a certified valuation analyst. So one of the things that I do um, in my role with East Step Doctor is I help companies who are looking to sell their business or looking to value their business for estate and gift tax. A, a lot of different reasons why you need a business valuation, but I help them try to put a number on what their business is worth. 
And so that's that taking extra courses and exams to get that certification just as Maggie does with her, with her designation. So that's one of my niches. Um, I do, like I said, tax and audit work for our firm. Um, headed up to Fort Wayne in about an hour to, to keep going on an audit. We're on actually right now. So, um, and then I do um, a variety of tax work. I work with Maggie on state address as well. So um, a lot of different experiences. And we're going to talk more about that here in the presentation is, is what the difference is between a, a small firm and a large firm. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to really focus on public accounting um, today. I know that that's, that's what we're kind of We've discussed so, uh, but we, we may be able to answer. If you've got questions on, on private industry, we can talk about that too. Um, and just so you understand the difference, I guess, before we get going, public accounting, we're working for clients who hire us to do a number of different things. So maybe that we just do a tax return for the organization. Maybe that we do write up work for the organization. We may do a lot of different things for that organization. But kind of the easiest way to describe it is that we act as their controller. So think of it that way. We're, we're acting as a lot of times are smaller businesses that may not be able to hire somebody full time to do that. So we work with them and also companies that do have controllers. We work with them to, to ensure that, that, that they have questions that are being answered and everything's kept compliant. Um, so that's anything to add there as far as public accounting. And then, and then so industry, you're actually working with a company. So you're, you're in the business, uh, you're working with the business's management to prepare internal financial statements, um, maybe even payroll reporting, accounts payable reporting, accounts receivable reporting, there are a lot of different things that fall into that bucket. So when we talk about public versus private, that's really what we're looking at. Um, and that's, that's something that a lot of times gets, the lines get blurred there sometimes. So public, we're working for a lot of different clients. Private, we're really working for one client, working within a, a company or organization. So uh, talk about life in public accounting a little bit. So for our business, we do a lot of tax work starting about this time. So we're going to start in, in January and move up through April. And um, about March, they'll wheel out the beds for us, and we'll start staying there overnight. And uh, we do a lot of, lot of tax work during this time period. So that's kind of our, our niche during this time of year. Um, and so the first thing I really want to emphasize is that it is much more than sitting behind the desk. So what do you guys think of when you think of an accountant? What's the, what's the perception when you think of an accountant? Ignore Ben Affleck's <laughs> version of the accountant. <laughs> numbers. Yeah, what's the numbers. Yeah. Just there Pocket protector, you got your calculator, and your glasses, <laughs> and you're sitting behind your desk, and you type it away, and you've got your 10 key, and couldn't be more different than what it actually is. Um, and I think that turns a lot of people away from the accounting profession. So um, we do a lot more than sit behind the desk. Uh, we have a lot of client meetings, especially this time of the year where we're meeting with our clients. We're doing tax planning for our clients. Um, so that's a big, a big piece. Problem solving and consulting. So uh, Maggie mentioned that. I know she does quite a bit of that with, with her clients. You want to talk a little bit more to that? Yeah. For instance, yesterday I had a uh, contractor who decided to set up his own QuickBooks. Okay, that's an accountant's nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> the contractor setting up their own books. And about a month ago, he came in with his QuickBooks. He came from Fort Wayne. And I looked at it, and it was a mess. And it was like, oh, okay, this is, this is, I can't figure it out. He had um, no income, <laughs> no expenses, and it was posting just in the strangest places. Well, yesterday, I kind of went through and said, okay, this is how you need to clean this up. And he was, he really wanted to do that. And a lot of clients don't, so we will do it for them. But he really wanted to do it. And so he came back yesterday, and I had such a great day. I was so proud of him. Because his QuickBooks, his bank account matched in the system. The bank rent was being done. <laughs> the savings account was there. Um, we had income and expenses, <laughs> and we had about five things that were meant to But that, that was a good day. I mean, I was just, wow, this is, this is why we do this. So sometimes it's going in. Um, I do forensic accounting also. Going in, I've had a lot of theft lately. It's, a, it's prominent out in, um, it's easy. For somebody to go in and look, take control of the office, and then steal money. It's, it's easy anymore. And the accounting systems, actually, if you don't put the passwords in place and some, 
segregation of duties or at least some control, it makes it easy for somebody. And so I have had recently had to go out and we have to have to find the effect and how much it was. So when I get a phone call, I might have my whole day planned. I've got this task list, right? I walk into the office and I get one phone call and my whole day changes. And I might not be in the office sometimes for a day or two to go next my schedule or schedules are kind of in and out. Um, so it's, it's exciting. It's not just sitting there and doing work. Now, tax is a little different. You do sit there a little more because you've got clients coming in to you and you're doing the work. But yeah, it's uh, that's kind of why I went out of industry. I was in industry for 18 years. I needed something. Uh, I need more challenge. I'm a person that, that likes to stay on the go and be kind of active. And so public accounting was very much for me than private. So that, that gives you a little bit of an idea of as far as the consulting and, and those types of things. We're really problem solvers a lot of times more than we are accountants. So uh, the clients are going to come to you with a need and you need to find a way to fill that need. Um, and it may be through accounting, usually it is, but a lot of times we've got to come up with outside the box ways to, to kind of meet their meet their needs. So um, the other couple things we've got here, networking and marketing. So this is an interesting piece um, that when I was in, in school, I never realized was a part of the accounting business. Uh, and really, until I came to ESAP Doctor, I didn't realize how important this piece is. Um, but really, we build business through networking and through marketing. So when we go out in the community, we're a lot of times doing marketing for ourselves for our firm. Um, and then we also attend networking events and do those types of things to try to um, become more prominent in the community. So when people think that they need an account, they know who to call. Um, they've got us come top of mind. So um, when you're going through school and you're learning the technical skills, that's a piece that, that oftentimes gets lost. You're not considering the fact that you're really working as a business owner in a way to try to continue to build business. So uh, networking and marketing is a, is a good skill. And I know there are opportunities for, for college students to do that as well, to, to familiarize yourself with those skills, and I would recommend that as something that, that I absolutely did not do when I was in college and, and wish I would have. Uh, I think I've, I've had to learn. It's a steep learning curve to be able to go out and do those types of things, to talk to people, and, and it's a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, So, um, especially for a lot of us who are a little introverted and maybe went into accounting thinking I wasn't going to have to use these types of things. So, uh, it's a really good a good skill to have and, and, and to know. And, um, Maggie does a great job of this. She's she's a great networker and marketer. So um, we all have our own skills and niches, I guess, is what I'm trying to say there. So and then firm building is really our last last thing as far as life in public accounting. And this this is more of an internal look at, at our firm and how we operate and how you know firms our size and similar size operate. Um, you're looking at, at training new staff. You're looking at bringing them up through the ranks, all the way from entry level to you know partner level. So we're looking at building this firm up and, and continually to to fill up kind of our pipeline, I guess, if you want to say, it, for lack of a better term, the talented young people who can come up and, and take the reins um, when called upon. So that's a really key piece to what we do is trying to make sure that as an entry level accountant, you're getting good experience so that eventually you can come up and and start filling in where needed. So that's probably not going to give anything to add on that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So variety of work. Um, we've talked about this a little bit already, but we do a lot of tax preparation in our firm. So you guys are pretty familiar with the individual tax at this point. Is that an accurate statement? Okay. <laughs> So, so January through April, we do quite a bit of individual tax. Um, we really we work with a, a number of clients, from um, business owners to retired people to college students, right, anywhere in between. So uh, we work with them to do their tax returns, uh, working with businesses. So that can include a number of different. So I know you guys are talking about Schedule C businesses. So we work with a lot of those types. Uh, we also work with. C corporations, S corporations, and partnerships, um, and then as Maggie mentioned earlier, states and trusts as well. So we have a variety of businesses that we work with. Those are all you know different business types, but the, the principles still remain the same. Uh, whether they're on QuickBooks or Peachtree, or if they've got a different type of accounting software, we have 
I just finished one that they keep, uh, a lot of them probably don't even know what these look like. I didn't until I saw it. But uh, seven, seven columns, is that right? <laughs> Should they lie about me at the office? But we have a really long piece of paper and it's like a ledger and they track everything on that now. So that, we deal with all, we see all the different kinds of things. So, so they record all their monthly, uh, expenses, all their monthly income. We tally it up and we, we transfer it and they factor them. So, um, so we see a wide variety of things there um, as far as businesses go. You want to talk more about estates and trusts? Um, estates and trusts, um, <coughs> with the way the uh, laws have changed, we see a little less on the estate than we used to. Um, but there's still um, something that you need to do when you get somebody passes away. There's a 1040, which you're familiar with, and a 1041. And that is um, the 1040 is what you file when you're alive. When you pass away, then your heirs or beneficiaries, in this case, would have to file a 1041 for income after you pass in that year. And it's, it's, it's a little bit different. Not everybody does uh, a state return. And then trust, um, there's all different types of trusts, grant and trust, credit trust, and not a lot of people specialize in that area. <laughs> um, your sole proprietor usually might specialize in 1040. There's a lot of people that do the most tax prep around that they don't specialize in the 1041. I think the thing for me, I was never going to work at trusted estate. When I first started in Houston, I had no interest. I was actually in the computer area and, and did right up work in business consulting, a lot of corporations. Never going to be trusted estate plans, what I told one of the senior partners. And then one year I had a client, she came in and she her son was a transplant and he had passed away. There was another having to deal with this passing of her, and she brought a picture of it and told me this, told me the story, and I was like, it, it was just like, and then that's how I kind of got into it. I realized it was at the lowest time in a person's life, and you you might only have to deal with this once or twice in your life, and so to help people navigate through that was the most rewarding experience. So you just never know where you're going to be where you're going to change as you grow and what you do uh, because five years from now there might be something else that I want to do. Um, so it's a maturity in your career. So we, we enjoy the trusted estate and that area is growing. Uh, we're actually, we do quite a few now. So we're kind of excited about that and we don't know what's going to happen in the estate area with the new administration. So we're kind of waiting on the new world. And yeah. So, um, farms is another area. Um, Maggie and I both do farm work along with just about everybody else in our office. So, we have a few that specialize in it, but they, the joke around the office, and as you, as you start to get out and, and do more of the farm returns, you'll learn that there's the three most prevalent words in the tax code are except for farmers. <laughs> so they have a very different set of tax rules that they're subject to versus um, other businesses. So that's an area we have with one partner in particular who's very, um, very adept at doing farm returns and he does the bulk of our work of each. Given the area of kind of rural nature, we all have farm clients. Somebody may, you know, just sell one or two things or harvest one or two crops on the side if it's a smaller venture than some of your large farms. But we do both there. Um, and then not for profit organizations, we do quite a bit of this work as well. So um, around Muncie, there's a lot of different not-for-profits, um, and our work for them really spans a wide variety. So we do tax prep work for them, and there are a lot that we do audit, audits for. Um, a lot of these not-for-profit organizations have to have audits so they can receive grants to stay funded. So we perform a lot of those audits uh, for those not-for-profit organizations. So that's a, that's a big niche of our business, really, in the fall. Um, so we're, we're just wrapping that up now. Now, Delaware County at one time had 1,200 not-for-profit organizations. I don't know if that if they're active, but that number has been out there. And the amazing part to me is I think we were the highest in the state on not-for-profits at one time. So um, it's, it's a growing area. Um, and you see a lot about it in the Muncie Journal and in the newspaper, things going on around Muncie. So. 
a lot of stuff there. So that's all about our, our tax work. So here's some other things that we do. Um, auditing and attestation, so I talked about that. But um, we, we do audit work. We also do uh, another different, couple different levels of service underneath of audit, and they're also considered attestation. So that's a big word for saying that we give our opinion on someone's financial statements is essentially what we're looking at there. So um, somebody brings us their stuff, we work with them to compile or review or audit their financial statements. And then we're giving an opinion, at least in two of those cases, that, that we you know, certify that what's there, to our knowledge, is correct. So um, the auditing area, again, big firms, a lot of times they want to take entry-level accounts and they want them to go into audit first. Um, it's, it's a good learning, it's, it's a good learning ground. You, you see a lot of things. Um, the unfortunate thing in a lot of firms is that they, this involves a lot of travel. So uh, for some people, that's great. For I know me personally, I, I didn't. Want to do that? I know Matt spoke to that earlier as well. So, um, it, so it has its pros and its cons for sure. Um, payroll and bookkeeping. This is another uh, big area for us. And uh, just to give you an idea of what our firm looks like structure-wise, we have 11 CPAs now that work with us. Um, we have one newly hired entry level who's passed his exam, but is not a licensed CPA. So we will have 12 here by year. Um, then, other than that, we've got five or six what we call accounting professionals. So these are people who don't have their CPA designation, but do a lot of our write-up work, a lot of our payroll work. They do a lot of the QuickBooks work, a lot of our accounting software. So, and we rely on them heavily for a lot of the things that we do. Um, they see it first and they work through it. So we, we have about five or six of those people that work in our office and they do a great job as well. Uh, and then we have several um, administrative staff uh, receptionists, IT staff, those types of people as well. So, so our payroll and bookkeeping, um, everybody's involved with this at some point in our firm. So nobody nobody gets to skip this step, and it's a very important step because if you don't understand how payroll works, I know we talked about that earlier. If you don't understand how payroll works, you will struggle as you get up to start doing corporate tax returns because that's really critical in how business operates. Uh, and I think you'll struggle with consulting, too, with the business if you don't understand how payroll works. Yeah, you've got to understand the whole cycle. Uh, business valuation, we talked about a little bit. We have three CBAs in our office. So, again, we're looking at people who either want to sell their business, they want to put a number on what the business is worth. So uh, we work with them to do those. Those are typically longer projects, um, but the things that we really enjoy doing, and that's another area where we're really growing uh, as as baby boomer generation starts to retire and pass down businesses, we're seeing that pick up as well. All that you speak to international. Uh, international tax. Um, I have clients all over the world. Um, QuickBooks Online has been a great, uh, a really great invention. Uh, when I first started, they didn't have QuickBooks Online, but I have clients that work in other countries in Liberia and Nepal. They're U.S. citizens that live outside of the United States. And so when you are a U.S. citizen, you need to file taxes on worldwide income. And that's a requirement. And so they come to me to do that. A lot of them are missionaries. Um, they work in not-for-profits in other countries. Um, but they have W-2 income. They have income from universities in other countries. Other countries don't necessarily have to do it. So you've got to compile it, and then you also convert to our currency when you report it. So it's, to me, it was kind of an interesting area, a little, you know, I guess a little, uh, something a little different than just the regular 1040. Um, so I kind of enjoy doing that. I do stay away from filing taxes, uh, tax forms in other countries. I don't do that. I um, only use U.S. forms. So somebody would have to go to a firm in Indianapolis if they wanted you to file like a German corporate return or something. And the consulting we talked about that at length already, but that's another large piece of what we do. And a lot of times that's tied into the other other services we provide. So, so the roles of an entry level staff accountant. Uh, this was me not too long ago, so I feel like I can explain this a little bit. And if you have questions as we're going through, I should have probably mentioned this at the beginning. Please stop and let us know. Um, 
if you think of something right as we're talking, just interrupt and, and go. We're happy to answer any questions we can. Uh, so an entry level stack accountant, and, and I've, I've done this really at two different firms, so it's been a good experience for me to be able to compare and contrast a large firm versus a, a more regional firm uh, like East Step Doctor. At East Step Doctor, we focus on a mix of day to day work. Um, in a stack of accountants development, then along with you've got different career development things you work on as well. So that mix of day-to-day -day work and, you know, again, it's a, there's a variety of work there. So we talk about assisting in tax preparation, financial analysis, um, assisting on audits, um, other attestation services here, reviews, and then we have compilations, uh, other financial reporting projects. So Somebody calls and says, I need a financial statement for the bank, which happens a lot. Um, we'll work to try to get them something that they can take with them to their banker. Uh, assisting with tax research, so if a partner has a question, um, they may come to the, the entry-level accountant with, with the details of their question and, and then expect the entry-level accountant to come back with, you know, code citations or things like that where they can show what, what the answer to the question is. Um, and then assisting with the payroll and bookkeeping functions as well. Our entry level accounts work with our accounting professionals to provide that service for uh, for the partners and for um, really anybody that, that needs that that assistance. So that's a that's an interesting role there as well, and that's something like we talked about that is something that's really good to learn. Uh, so don't take the blow off payroll class is what I'm saying. Um, it, it's good it, it's good to be challenged. You'll be glad that you were. Um, so that's a mix of the day-to-day -day work, uh, and then on the next slide, we've got some things that you do as career development. And this is, again, one of the things that I mentioned earlier that I wasn't very polished on early on in my career. Um, it's something that I really wish I had a little more experience in college, um, is the networking opportunities and specialized skill building. So networking opportunities um, in a small town like Muncie, it's nice because there's a lot of different opportunities. You've got events through the Chamber of Commerce. We have various networking groups, service organizations, and, and through membership in these groups and attending these meetings and things like that, you really get to know a lot of the people in, the, in this city. Um, whereas when I was in Indianapolis, you can go to these meetings all day long, and you're sitting you're meeting new people every time. So um, it allows you to develop new relationships and really grow those relationships as you continue to attend these events. Yeah. So has Ben made you go to BNI yet for him? I am actually in the Thursday morning. Oh, uh, are you? Okay. Yeah. So Maggie was in there for about 17 years. 17 years, and then I took her seat about two years ago. So, okay. so yeah, I have been in the Yeah, I go there. I, I go in there. <laughs> yeah. So, so B&I is an example, Business Networking International, that's an example of a networking group here in Muncie. There's four of them, um, and you go and work with other business professionals to try to um, refer business back and forth. So that's an example of one that we're involved in. Um, and then we talk about career development through specialized skill building, and this is your, your CBA, your CITP. You start to develop an idea of what you want to do with your career. So usually within the first two years, you'll start to decide on, on how, what career track you want to you want to go down after you've seen a lot of different things. And then, uh, at least at our firm, you're, you're really given um, a lot of leeway to go ahead and pursue what it is that, that you want to do. And I think Maggie and I have both found that to be the case uh, for us. And, and that's that way a lot of other firms as well. So, um, but that's a, that's a large advantage, I would say, to, to um, working at a smaller firm. Um, and I, I thought it might be nice to give them your perspective as, as kind of a role. Um, from the other side of the spectrum. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think for me, as as a partner, what I want to see my people and my team, we have a team. We don't, they're not employees, they are a team. We work together every day. But what's important to me is that they grow personally, that they are getting out of public accounting what they, what they need. And that might be, uh, one thing about not-for-profit organizations and so many in Delaware County is that part of networking is being on boards. If you want to be on the board, you can, they're always looking for accountants. But the main thing that I always tell people when I'm thinking about it is, do you have a passion for what they do? You don't need to sit on 20 boards. You just need to sit on the boards that you're really there now. And because I want you to grow personally. And we find that that works because we're like family. So it, for me, it's like seeing my kids are growing up and they're, they're starting to have interest in things. 
and they're enjoying what they're doing every day. Um, because you're going to work every day for what, 40 years, 50 years, and you should enjoy it. So I think for me, um, and it helps them grow, uh, it will change direction of maybe where they're going to go in the firm. Maybe that you know, we have one partner that is an audit person and he does peer reviews. So his, he's kind of networked in the area of um, the uh, Indiana CPA. He does a lot with them and he's on the peer review committee. So he goes out and grades other accounting firms on how they're dealing with their financial statements and their audits. And so that is an area for him that he has chosen. And he's a detailed person. You have technical people within the firm. So, and some of us, I'm more of a consultant. Um, my background started out in marketing, and then I went into account. So I have a tendency to do more towards the consulting and kind of some other area. The roles really shift as you as you move up. Um, Maggie really really hit the nail on the head there, talking about you know their focus on development of younger staff, and really the, our partners do a great job of that. Um, but uh, that's really a key for, for what they do, from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. Being outside of the community, I guess. Uh, so staff accountant success. We wanted to talk a little bit about what you can do to be successful as an entry level accountant. Um, so that's, I assume, the goal for most of you getting you know, through all this is to become, you know, an accountant in some some way, shape, or form. So um, we wanted to talk about what what kind of some good things are. So for us, um, we like for our, our staff accounts, professional staff, to be able to be eligible for the CPA exam. So uh, there there are requirements out there online. Most of the time, it requires uh, the equivalent of five years of college credit, um, and then you take a four part examination, uh, which is it's difficult, um, but it's worth it when you get through. So a lot of our younger entry level um, staff accounts, that's what we're looking for there. Um, but we also want them to have a working knowledge of accounting and tax concepts. So you're getting, in this class really seems like a great course because you're getting a lot of that baseline knowledge of ten forties. Um, and that's really what we do a lot of January through April is ten forty work. So being comfortable, being able to get into a ten forty, understand how the pieces fit together, how you know the deductions offset the income, and those types of things. You're really you're ahead of where a lot of your counterparts are going to be because of that that working knowledge. Um, and preparing tax returns at, at this stage is also a great that's a great opportunity um, for you through the, the programs you've got here. So that's one thing we look at. Um, most of the stuff you will be doing as a staff account, you'll probably learn on the job. So we, we like to have that baseline knowledge so you understand the concepts. Uh, but then specialized things you'll be doing you'll learn throughout the job training. So different clients have different needs, different um, requests or different requirements a lot of times. So the things you'll be doing, you'll be learning on the job as you go. But it's all rooted in that kind of working knowledge of accounting and accounting concepts. Uh, we need to, need to know those things. And the last piece down there is probably, at least to me, the most important. Um, and that's a strong work ethic and a willingness to learn new things. And I think even in that, when I've been there three years, I think that really is a, a, a good mix of, of things to have to be able to be successful, no matter what you choose to do. So you may be in this class and you may decide to accounting not for you if you go into something else. A strong work ethic and a commitment to what the work you're doing and a willingness to try new things has been, I think it's critical, uh, but especially in public accounting because there are so many different things that you can do. You know, if a project comes through and nobody wants to take it. Take it and grab it and go with it and see what you can do. Uh, nobody expects it to be perfect as an as entry-level accountant, but it's good to get those experiences. And, and, uh, and the hard work, obviously, during tax season, we, we joke about that, but it is strenuous at times. Um, we're, we're there together a lot, you know, and uh, we have a lot to get done in a short time. So that strong work that comes into play quite a bit. Accounting firms make most of their income during the first part of the year. I mean, a, a great deal of your income is January through April 15th. Mm -hmm. Um, because you got W-2s, 1099s, that's in January, and with the new law this year, it's going to make it a little more challenging for us because they have to be done by January 31st. 
uh, and some clients are a little slower about getting stuff in, so we're having to push. And um, then, of course, you start focusing on all the corporates and all of the deadlines for partnership moved to March 15th. So now we've got all that back in March. So we've got a very short window to get things done. And most people don't, clients only think, they think about that they want to get their stuff in. They think if they're the only client. You have. So it makes it a little more challenging that time of year. <clears throat> Any questions on that stuff? No? Okay. So another thing we want to talk about is client management. Um, the difference between a good client and a bad client. So we put, I put some traits here that uh, I have found are common in my good clients. Maggie may have some more to add there as well, but my good clients are well organized. They're people whose books are in order. Even if it is the seven column sheets of paper that, I mean, if it's organized, we can work with them. So uh, people who are well organized, this is a big one for us, is keeping your business and your personal expenses separate. So you all have been talking about Schedule C businesses. That's really easy for the business owner to start using as a personal credit card for business expenses or vice versa, to use the business credit card to pay for a meal when he takes his family out. And then he tries to deduct that on his tax return. So it's really nice when you've got a business owner who's committed to keeping the business to business and personal to personal. That's a really nice thing there. Um, willing to ask questions and is considerate of the guidance that they're given. So we don't expect everybody to listen to everything we say, um, but we like when people ask us questions because uh, kind of the way I always look at it is it's 15 minutes in July with the question, or it's four hours in February trying to correct what they've done because they didn't ask. So uh, we encourage our clients to call us on a regular basis, to check in. If they have questions, we help them to answer those questions. Uh, and then Maggie really touched on this a little while ago, but prompt and submitting time-sensitive materials. So this is especially the case during tax season where the client who brings their tax work in on April 15th and once their tax return on April 15th. We have some to bring it in on the fifth. Yeah, I had somebody call me last year yeah. and wanted to bring it in. I said, we're fine in extension. It's just, it's, you just. It's not all in the shoebox. <laughs> Most of the time, they are. Most of the time, they're waiting that way they are. Yeah. It's the ones that are really messy that wait because they don't they put it off. But I think that, you know, the important thing is for me is if I'm doing it on April 15th and I'm rushing it through, I could make a huge mm -hmm. error. And I just said, you're not getting the best of me today. And I'm not going to do this. We'll find an extension and we'll do it, at, you know, maybe tomorrow or the next day where we have more time to work with it. So I think some of it is training our clients, too, sure. I think. Um, and some of them are willing to be trained. <laughs> some aren't. <laughs> so that, that's what we look at with, with good clients. Uh, and those are things that if you end up being a business owner, keep that in mind for your CPA that, to not keep your um, <coughs> and shoe box and to yeah. together. Right. Yeah. So that, that is helpful. Or at least put them in order by extent. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 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 Something that's organized we can use. Yeah. yeah well, and right. usually if you explain to them, that's how they get charged. Like the more work you do and the more organization, the, ch you know, the cheaper it is for you. Yeah. And usually once you explain it in dollars and cents, then they start taking a little more yeah. time. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about this, but uh, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more. It's different career options for accountants. So right now is a great time to become an accountant. There are so many different career options for accountants at all levels, all experience levels. I mean, I, it's, it's a good time to be an accountant, I think. Mm -hmm. um, public accounting, there's a number of opportunities. And we've already talked a lot about that, the different variety of things that you can do. But, um, but really, even at larger firms, you can specialize in just one area. So if that's something that interests you in just being really, really good in one area, that, that can offer some appeal as well. So public accounting has a ton of different options just by itself of things you can do. Uh, private industry, so Maggie mentioned that earlier. She was in, in industry for about 18 years. Um, but that's another great option for people. Um, it, it's something that you're working with one business, you're focused on that, uh, it, it becomes your day-to-day, -day, so it's you're not seeing new stuff, but you're seeing you know, you're really getting invested in that. So that's that's an option there as well. Uh, governmental work, so all these different government entities have a 
accountants that work with them. So um, don't mind him. He's just our photographer. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so all these governmental entities have people who, who work for them, do, it, do their accounting work. And so um, that's an option as well. Not the profit organizations, so we talked about that, but they also have people that, that do their books. Um, a lot of times this may be the executive director of the organization, but they may have a, an internal account that does their work as well. So not for profits, that's a, that's a good way to go. Uh, education, so if, if you really want to take it the next step, you can go into teaching. Um, I enjoy doing I do a little bit of that on the side as well. I, I like doing that, so uh, that's something that as you, as you progress through your career, it may be something that you want to do. Um, either full time or part time. So you've got those options there as well. As a, especially um, if you if you opt for a master's degree and you opt for a CPA license, you really the doors will open to you as far as education is concerned. Um, and then consulting, we talked at, at length about that. But again, that's another specialized niche that a lot of accounting firms are looking for people who are able to consult. Mm -hmm. Any questions before we talk about the fun stuff? <laughs> you had mentioned, uh, sure. I have a student in my Anderson class, and one of the things you could have put up there that she does, that she likes, that she says she does, is uh, forensic accounting sure. mm -hmm. as an option. And he's looking at, can you explain a little bit maybe of what uh, maybe the FBI could be looking for? Do you have any knowledge of that? Um, well, actually, a lot of accountants do go to work for the FBI. Um, a lot of it is, is getting into books. Maybe you're looking for money laundering. Um, that's a big thing right now. Um, the other thing is, is um, sometimes there's two sets of books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, as with the moth has been caught with that, um, they're looking for people embezzling. It just it depends on what the focus is, but now the FBI, I know an accountant that went to work for the FBI and really enjoys it. So, and they travel a lot, um, but they, since they have an understanding of, of uh, accounting, they can dig a little deeper into the detail work where somebody that doesn't, you can't, you're not going to find maybe investment unless you know what you're looking for. So I think. Those are some of the things. Um, they brought up when you said two sets of books, and then it also goes back to when Joe had mentioned getting a um, the financial ready for the bank. Do a lot of your clients have two sets of books, one for tax and one for the bank? Not really in that situation. I don't think we have a whole lot that, that fall into that bucket, but we do have some that, that have two separate sets of books, one for financial statements, so if they're an audited client, if they're a reviewed client, that certain rules that they have to follow, versus a tax client who has probably a little less stringent rules to follow as far as being able to take accelerated depreciation, things like that that you can't do on, on the book side. So to report your financials, you may have one set of books. To report on the tax return, you may have a different set of books. That's what, you said. That's, that's what I was, you yeah, know, I was getting yeah. how many of your clients, or do most of them just go on the cash basis, and then that's, that's fine? Mm -hmm. Most of them. Uh, I have quite a few financial statements. I don't know what percent. I'm trying to think. Each one of uh, and the firm partners have their own client base. So I know as I think about mine, I have less financial statement type clients and more consulting. And so their books are that they keep in house are taxed, more or less. Um, but then David and some of the other partners focus more on gap financial statements. Uh, we have construction companies, we have somebody in the firm that specializes in that. So of course, you have the percentage of completion method and all that, and then the tax return has the vote to tax differences. Um, yeah. So that, that is common, um, I think, those two separate. Any other questions? All your questions have been answered today. That's great. <laughs> that is great. So we were just going to talk a little briefly about this. Um, we know that you've, you've seen a lot of these things, um, but we just want to kind of talk a little bit about 
how they're applied in practice and how often they're applied in practice. So uh, oftentimes you can learn something and you may not understand how it applies until you actually start using it. And it sounds like you guys have are going to be using it if you haven't already through the programs you've got here doing, doing individual tax work. But um, so Schedule A, we talk about a lot of those different deductions. Um, obviously, for the, the clients we work with, that's very common. Um, some of the more common ones we see are, are mortgage interest deductions. That's usually a, a bigger one. Uh, a lot of people who don't have that may not get to file Schedule A, so um, that's a big one. Um, you've got some of the other charitable contributions is, is one that we have. Medical expenses is one that we see quite a bit of. Um, property taxes, uh, excise tax. So excise tax is like what you pay maybe for flights on your vehicle. Um, so you're looking at that. Personal property tax. Um, what am I missing? Investment. Investment. Investment expenses. So, um, so tax prep fees are another one. If you pay somebody to, to do your taxes, which in our case, all of our clients want to most of our clients pay us to do what they're doing. So, uh, so we, uh, just, yeah, my mom doesn't, but everybody else does. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> on the ones that pay us, we, we include their tax prep fee as well as a, as a Schedule A deduction. So, and that's one that, like I said, almost all of our clients have that as well. So, um, we really see a lot of those um, come through. And the way they're organized is different for everybody. So we'll have people who will bring in stacks and they'll have nice and neat charity receipts. Um, and it's all broken down for us. It's very nice. Medical expenses, very nicely organized. And then we have the guy who brings in one Goodwill slip and says, I donated some clothes and stuff. I think it's probably worth two or three thousand dollars. <laughs> and so, you know, we just work with those types of people um, as best we can, I guess, in that case. So. You have anything to add on those? Or did I, did I miss anything? I, yeah. When we go through it in class, and I, I was kind of interested in this, um, do you really see a lot of the uh, miscellaneous 2%? Because it just doesn't seem like that 2% is a, kind of could be a big threshold yeah. to jump over and with their AGI. Yeah. I do. I do um, realtors, um, insurance agents, brokers, a lot of mileage. Okay. And that's Usually, those individuals have so much mileage and other expenses, especially investment brokers, because they pay for a lot of things on their own. Even as an employee, I'm kind of amazed at how much they pay, and they will, they do fine on being able to take that. Now, I think with medical expenses, uh, the hard part is it's down to 10 percent, and so unless you really have something catastrophic. You're not able to take those, although the health insurance premiums are helping a little bit in that area now. Um, for because a lot of people, some people just didn't carry health insurance and now they do. So now they're able to. Um, and our, our older clients usually will be able to get that. Yeah, that that nursing home, our baby boomers, I hate to say that because I'm not going to but uh, nursing home expenses are really getting up there and uh, long-term care and a lot of them haven't picked up long-term care policies. So you're seeing a lot of them, and especially they're in their 70s and 80s. Um, we're seeing, I'm seeing a lot on their single. Yeah. That's going through. And that's the perfect storm too because if you consider you're looking at 10% of AGIs, kind of that haircut we talk about for medical expenses, a lot of the retired people who work with in their nursing homes also have Lower adjusted gross income, lower AGI, so that threshold's lower, and then you mix in sixty thousand dollars of nursing home expenses annually, and you're really looking at a pretty hefty schedule of deduction for a lot of those clients. Yeah, and that's a tax tool actually is you know IRAs. A lot of them are taxable, and so they were rollovers. So a lot of times, a lot of uh, retired people only do R and D's. You know they. It's a, I have this number in investment, I wanted to stay there. It's, it's, it's a, a mind thing. So they don't want to use it, and they don't need it. They're on Social Security and maybe have some other things. But when you pull out the IRA, of course, it's taxable. But if they have an $80,000 nursing home bill to pay for it, we're finding that's a way to start getting some of that money out of IRA and not have such a tax hit as a tax planning tool. You mean taking some out 
a little at a time. Yeah, taking more out to pay for this nursing home mm -hmm. bill. Um, because usually you've got a, a child that's trying to figure out how are we going to pay for this? Should we take it out of an IRA? Should we take it out of their savings? Well, what you do is you call the account and say, well, if we take it out of the IRA and you figure how much the expenses are and see, well, yeah, we could get it out here. Yeah, there's a little bit of a tax hit, but that's to get that, R, that IRA down. Because with IRA, when you inherit them, a traditional IRA, you've got to take it over one year, five years, or the life of the beneficiary. Well, a lot of people, you know, children want to get that money out. You know, they want to cash it in. Well, some of them don't think that, well, I'm, I inherited this. So I shouldn't have to pay taxes. So if they don't call their accountant and find it out that they're going to pay taxes on it, then they could have a $100,000 hit. Which I paid a lot of taxes when my father died, and I ended up in 2008 when I lost quite a bit of money. I decided to cash in, and, mm -hmm. and when I did my taxes that year, my taxes was like triple. Yeah. So what you want to do a lot of times with our planning is, like I'm doing planning right now for somebody that should I take it over five years, or should I go ahead and take it over the life of the beneficiary? And I so we're trying to figure out what tax bracket she wants. And if she took so much, I'm figuring that she can take it over three years and not jump bracket. Because what you don't want to do is take a huge lump sum and jump two or back and get up to the 30. I think my bracket I think you yeah. jump the bracket. Yeah. Like so we always just ask, and I always tell my clients, if somebody passes away in your family, just give me a call. Let me kind of help you navigate through that. The government gets enough money out of this. Let's try to keep it at a minimum. So, Schedule C, um, we've talked a little bit about those, but um, we see a lot of these type of people as well. So, these are people who own a business either as a sole proprietor or as a single member of an LLC, typically, are the two is probably the most prevalent options that we see there. Um, can be a variety of businesses, really, can be just about anything. Um, so, we, we see a lot of different types of businesses that, that file this way. Um, and your deductions, your income, I mean, those are those are pretty common. You guys have probably looked at a lot of those things, but um, really some of the more noteworthy items there are depreciation um, for Schedule C business. You want to make sure you're getting all that captured. Um, Section 179 deductions have been great for small businesses who are now able to buy equipment. And instead of having a depreciator over five or seven or ten years, now they can take the expense all in the first year when they purchase it. So. That's been a, a real change for our clients, especially our farm clients, really, that uh, have scheduled that. But Schedule C clients have seen a, a great benefit there as well. Um, well, that's a 50% bonus depreciation, yeah. personally, personally, because you can take it whether you have income or a loss. So we are kind of, that will be expiring soon. So uh, I think one other thing that you want to think about is if we're talking about a Schedule C. But do you talk about hobby losses or hobbies at all in here? A little. Sometimes people, right now the IRS, I came across the wire, is going to start targeting some of the um, uh, Ribbon and Fields, uh, Mary Kay type businesses. Because a lot of times they're really a hobby. They're not really a business. But they are going to start focusing a little bit on some of those areas. I noticed it came across the wire in last week or something. That it, um, so I think the important part of the Schedule C is your income and deductions, but the second part is, is look at it and see what it is and see if it really was a big one. We looked at a tax court case in the, in the class and we spent maybe a half hour on it going through, and it was a guy claiming that he was a professional fisherman mm -hmm. and claiming $30,000 losses every year. And then uh, they finally caught up with him because his wife made a lot of money somewhere else mm -hmm. doing other things. And so he was claiming to be a professional fisherman when it turned out he really was. Yeah, you got to compliment it. There's just a lot of different factors. So I think that, I think we're going to see probably in the next few years just based on some of my reading, I think it looks like they're going to start looking at some of that a little closer. Um, 
So Schedule B, I think you guys maybe just got into that. So that's one that we see a lot that's very common in our, with our client base. These are people, most of the time we see this with investments, uh, where people are buying and selling investments and brokerage accounts. Uh, we also see this with uh, people selling fixed assets. So uh, we could sell an asset and we, we look at determining base, which is another piece of that. And that's a big piece of Schedule B is determining basis, whether it is stock or whether it's, um, you know, sale, maybe a, a second home in the Schedule B possibly. Um, we're looking at determining basis to, to make sure that the client's not paying any more capital gains than what they need to pay. So, um, but we also want to make sure we don't understate the capital gains amount uh, and, and get into trouble with the IRS. So, really the name of the game there is to make sure you've got that basis amount as accurate as you can get it. Um, and that, you know, that comes from good tracking, it comes from um, responsible depreciation practices, a lot of different things there. But, that. uh, but that's, that's a key piece of, of Schedule B. And a lot of times we're finding, um, and it's been less so lately, that in an investment account, brokers don't always track the basis of your stock investments. So you'll get an investment statement and the proceeds will be $5,000 and your basis shows it's zero or not applicable or not tracked. And so it, it becomes the account's job and the broker's job to work together to try to figure out what was this stock really purchased for because you don't want to take $5,000 in capital gains all in one year. Um, you don't have to. I mean, you have to. You have to. But, but, so that that is, is kind of um, those two go hand in hand. If you have anything to add there, I think with the yeah with the tax law changes a few years ago, the, ba the basis is the basis is supposed to be transferred from broker to broker, and we're still in that phase in period. I think it's going to be a lot better, but you still have clients that come in bought something like 1940. I don't remember what I paid for it. So then you've got to go back and say okay. You know, about when in 1940. Well, I, so then I go back and sometimes have to do the research on the average, on the historical, and come up with a figure. Um, and Purdue uh, also has it for land values. Sometimes people will come in; they were given land when they were, you know, pretty young, and now they're in their 70s and they don't know how much they paid for it, or, or if it was gifted, or whatever. So we can go back and do an index through the index and figure out what the value is based on today's values, we can take it back. So I think there are some things on basis. You, sometimes you have to get a little more, I don't want to say creative, because I'm sure not good in accounting, but sometimes you have to dig a little farther. Back on the uh, Schedule C, yes, could you talk just a minute on travel and meals? And do most, do most of your clients use a per diem? Because that's one of the things we've talked about. Or do most of them have actual receipts every time? Most of the ones that I work on have receipts. Okay. I don't see per diems very often. Um, and they try to take as many liberties as they can. So that's something you really have to watch. Um, because it's an, it's an increased deduction for them. So they want to try to lower their taxable amount. And um, so you have to be careful. Was this business related or was it personal? Um, did your family really need to go on a business trip with you? Or should that be a business expense? Mm -hmm. So, a lot of times they give you the receipt, and they know that they'll put a notation on there that they're they're really personal. But they're they're they'll go well. It's up to you. So they're like, we look. You need to make sure you look through your documentation. We found one last year where it was a huge trip. And it was none of them. It's really business. But they brought a box of stuff in. And I just thought that for me, I have to do diligence on a return. If I'm looking at meals and entertainment and it looks a little high, then I'll probe a little bit. Um, and so then I started going through the receipts. So, yeah, I'm sure things get by. But I think you have to stand back and look at that Schedule C and does this make sense? Um, because sometimes you find that it doesn't, and then, and then you dig a little farther. Um, I think the other thing with the schedule C, C I kind of liked is when they went with a simplified method on the home office. Now that we can use that instead of you can do simplified method or you can do actual on the home offices. And um, similar to the yeah, there for the home but probably the more. We did regular. 
a lot, which is okay. Is it the first time I got it? Yeah, like how much of your house you use. Yeah, which is good. That's what being is the house. Based on that. Right, but the simplified method, after I got it, is based on the regulations that they're talking about. Pretty much, they're not going to look at anybody that uses that, and so, so that was what we were kind of told in our tax class. That so, um, and it's hard to explain. I think tax clients have a hard time when you tell them they can't take their home office because sometimes they really don't have a home office. And but it's saying you know it's really only saving you twenty dollars here, you know, and it's really not worth the risk. So, and sometimes you have to put it in dollar and cents, and then they say, yeah, you're right. You know, they're thinking that because they can take mortgage interest, they're not thinking about the percent part of it. They're thinking they're getting this huge deduction, and they're, they just don't understand how it's computed. When you have a client, like you were explaining earlier, with a schedule C and this huge deduction for meals and entertainment and those types of things, how do you handle... So you have a client trying to, for lack of a better term, pull one over on right, somebody. How do you handle something like that without losing your client and, and you keeping do. your your integrity? Sometimes you do. I have somebody put a whole new kitchen in the office supply. Oh my. Now, the kitchen, whole new office supply, whole new kitchen. I had like eighty, ninety thousand dollars in office supplies. And that was perfect. I'm looking at this one. Wow. And of course, as an accountant, we go through to see if things are supposed to be moved to fix assets. I mean, because people sometimes will put equipment and repairs and maintenance or whatever, so you move it. So I'm going through and I'm seeing these huge numbers, and I'm saying to like a kitchen store, and I'm just like, this is not weird. And with a new kitchen, they build a new house, and there's a kitchen in there. Sometimes you have to take a stand. It's not for me. I worked hard to get here, and that test, I, I, I swore I would never take a test like that again. I could lose my license. I mean, um, there's an accountant who was an accountant who now practices in India. He does not have a CPA license. He went to prison for a few years. I, so sometimes you just have to say. I'm not going to do this. Now, there are some clients that you call them, you know, and say you're busted. Mm -hmm. no, and, and I don't appreciate Yeah, they'll, they'll let you pull it off. They'll let you do whatever you want. And, and I talk to them about my displeasure. And uh, now, will they come back another year and do it? I don't know. But the, and then I might have to make the decision is it worth it? Because at the end of the day, I have standards that I want to look up to, and maybe they just need to find somebody else. Because there are, there are accountants that will do whatever somebody wants them. And I'm just not that accountant. Uh, no, our firm does not. We, we, we have quality control procedures, and we just, we, uh, everybody is, you know, does the due diligence on the return. It's more than just putting numbers on the return. Yeah. Well, you got to stand behind that. I mean, that was my name's on that return. Mm -hmm. was, I signed it at the end of the day. And so, yeah. That's the big thing. So, I guess the last piece is retirement accounts. Um, this is a big tax planning tool that we use. So, um, uh, are we up any time? We probably. I don't know. Are we okay? Uh, usually we take a break at 10. Okay. Yeah. So we'll okay. So retirement accounts, um, we use those as kind of a tax planning tool uh, for us as, as an adjustment to income a lot of times. Um, depending on that, so that's thinking on the contribution side of a, a retirement account. You know, if you're putting after tax dollars into a traditional IRA, for instance, you're able to, to that's a really a preferential tax adjustment deduction for they're on the front page of the return, which then is going to affect your state tax return and a whole host of other things. So uh, we really like our clients to be able to do that when possible. Um, and then we talked a little bit about distributions from retirement accounts when somebody reaches that age where they're able to start pulling that money out. And that really is it's important with, with the clients you're working with to understand how to take it out, 
when to take it out. Uh, those are probably the two most critical things, I think. Well, there's also conversion. I don't know if you've talked much about. There's a traditional and Roth IRA. So you, can, so you can convert a traditional IRA to a Roth. And in some cases, we will look at, um, okay, they're going to have some down years and income. They're going to be a lower tax bracket. So it might be better to convert. And why would you want to do that? Well, you don't have to take an R&D at age 70 and a half on a Roth. So, and for an heir, um, that's a good thing. Uh, so sometimes it's in estate planning that we get into that where somebody probably maybe you their wishes and they tell us to save. Put all your money in these deferred accounts, and it's great while you're working. But the problem is, is you know, especially some of the doctors and stuff, uh, surgeons down in Indianapolis, you know, they might have 40 million in an IRA. Imagine what that RMV is. And so now we're getting hit with all these taxes. And so you can do some planning on the front end. Um, so when we do tax returns and we, do, we see their retirement accounts, when we're not just throwing numbers on a return. We're actually looking to the future. You know, I see the fair market values of those IRAs. They're coming on a 54 and an income. Maybe we better suggest looking at some planning. They're about 20 years away from retirement here, so or, or 10 or whatever it is. And maybe we can help them save some tax dollars overall or, or at least help maybe some of their beneficiaries. Uh, because when the beneficiaries inherit the IRA, they're going to pay taxes on the full amount. Yeah. So we kind of look at some of that stuff. Yeah. One of the nice things, too, about retirement account contributions is you can make those after the end of the year. So if my mm -hmm. client comes in and brings in their tax return, and I'm, I'm doing their tax return, and I see that maybe they owe $500, and you really don't want to pay $500 to the government, there may be an option where they could go put $2,000 in a traditional IRA and eliminate that tax liability altogether. So really you're paying yourself a little bit more, but you're not paying the IRS. Mm -hmm. So that you can do those contributions up to April 15th, and left to treat them as they were previous year. Mm -hmm. So that's a really nice feature and leaves out a lot. I think HSA is so HSA that way as well. Yeah. So um, you can do that with HSA, so we utilize those kind of Yeah. And, and with the Affordable Care Act, that's been a big part of our tax planning for our clients that have taken the advanced tax credit as well uh, to try to keep their income down so they don't have to pay it back. We use these retirement accounts and HSAs. Yeah, I think it's for like a family of two. It was around $61,000 your AGI had to be under to get some of those. For your, and so with the HSA and an IRA, they were able to stay under. So that meant they didn't have to pay back that $12,000 because it's all it's an all or nothing thing with the tax premium. If you go over that dollar amount, you have to pay it back. And so it, right now is the time of year, actually November and December, when people are calling us and we're doing all this planning and making sure that everything's in order. Give me your, uh, maybe your top two things if you had a, a new hire come in and then you were reviewing their work. The two top things that you would probably be the most disappointed in them. Like red, for example, missing a red flag or um, I, I try to get across in this class, don't submit me a tax return where somebody owes $12,000 because that's not realistic for what kind of things that we're doing in here. Now, I don't know if you guys have 12000 is a common tax bill. I hope not. But uh, what would be a red flag for you that says, okay, employee, you should have seen this. Can you comment on this? I think for me as a reviewer, um, we have, let's say you have a new client come in, they bring their tax returns from previous years. You do the, I have somebody doing the tax return for me and they leave off the total schedule E. And I've seen it, that it was on because a lot of the previous tax returns, not that they haven't had changes, but a lot of them will give you a clue about what the client usually has. And so, to me, you need to take the time. I pull up the previous year and, I, and 
and I look at this year and um, so that is one thing is, is taking the time to stand back and look at your work. You know, make sure that it, you know, if their AGI the year before was 55,000 and this year it's 10,000, what are those differences? Oh, we're missing maybe a 1099 off. We know they have R&D. So I expect the individual doing the return, I like, we do know. They will go through and they will do the return and then I'll review it. I do a lot of my own returns, but, um, but there are notes and say, well, we're missing, we had this last year. We had an R&D from Fidelity, we don't have it this year. But I guess my disappointment would be if that wasn't in the notes to tell me that, because that's mainly just standing back and taking the time to look at the, what the product is, what the product is, and does it make sense. Yeah, I don't know a lot of reviewing yet, but in the little I have, I think that's, I mean, I think you, you sit back and look at the intern, you mean data input on tax return, and we've got, instead of $6,000 in the expense, we've got $600,000 in the expense, and they give that to me, and obviously that's not correct. Um, they, they hit zero too many times. And that, that's the kind of careless mistake that if you don't step back and look at it, you can, you know. Or they just keep the federal withholding. I run the tape. I run the tape. I don't want to find them more assignment. It has to be 4,000 and not getting 400 and something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always run the tape just before I print the return and make sure that my state and county withholdings and that my federal. We have a, a, a comp check. So when it goes through assembly, they actually do that up there, but it's so frustrating to me to print a return and have them catch that. So I do it myself, and I kind of run a tape sometimes on the W-2s to make sure line 7 matches. Um, the other thing is, is on uh, retirement, a taxable amount and non-taxable amount sometimes, or the total amount, total distribution, and then I'll have a taxable amount. Sometimes those are different. But they won't catch that. So it's me falling down and and making sure that they get that because what's going to happen when it goes to the IRS is they're going to match the 1099 odds, and then they get a notice. You get into that notice pool, and then it's actually kind of a, it's a bare thing when you make a simple mistake like that. So that's why we kind of have some procedures in play. But everyone does. It. Yeah, we all we're human. We all make so mistakes. That's the other piece is everybody makes those mistakes. It's just catching it before your computer catches it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't know how you feel when I come back into your office. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I mean, I'm getting the review notes. It's nice because I know there's a little more for the next time. So I know if I've done this and that's not correct, then I know next time that that's something to focus on. And I, I think it's good. I mean, it, Getting review notes is not a bad thing. I mean, unless you're just really screwing stuff up and <laughs> over and over and over and over, it's the same notes. Yeah. Um, but to me, I, I appreciate getting review notes. So we had a uh, one of the original partners, doctor, an ASAP doctor. I remember when I first started, and and I would do a write up or or something, and he always found something. It was like a game after five years. I was like. Okay, I've got it this time, and you know, and then he'd say, "Well, what about this?" Oh, I think that. So it's, you know, it's um, it's a learning. I learn something every day, even at the partner level. There isn't a day that I don't know how to go live and learn something new today. It's, it's just an ongoing process in our career. Usually, so. I'm not listening a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> I learn a lot of new things every day. So. Um, how many different types of tax programs have you used over the years, and which one was your favorite? Um, well, when I started out doing taxes, we didn't have a tax program. <laughs> 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 so obviously, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the stage where you wrote it on an input sheet, and it went to a computer department, and they keep it there, and then you get this return back, and you review it, and then you find a mistake, and you go back and forth. But the only, I've used that, it's for my tax, and I've also used process and tax. Process and tax is made, it's the CCH 
product, and it's mainly accounting firms who use it. Um, there's the Alter, um, Alter Tax. I've seen Alter Tax. We purchased a firm in Anderson, and they were on Alter Tax, so I have seen that one. I prefer Francis and Tax because I do multi state. And I like the way it does the multi-state, and I've heard that it's pretty good in that area. Um, but others use ultra fast, love it. So I think it just depends on what you learn. It's kind of like QuickBooks with Peachtree. I don't know how you, if you have a, a client that loves Peachtree and they want to convert to QuickBooks, the first thing I tell them is they're going to hate it for at least six months. I said you're going to hate it next to six months. And that's about right. Because it's about take about six months, the first six months are like, why do we do that? So I'm like, why do we do this? So, but usually by the end of six months, they they kind of got over into the QuickBooks thought process and things go well. So I think it's all in what you you just have a lot of time learning. Good. That's a good question. Thank you. What about um, how? Especially this is probably more for Joe. How big of an item, or how big of a deal was it for you to do timekeeping on everything that you use? That's a, that's a, I, we probably should have mentioned that. That is something that takes a lot of time to get used to. Um, so, county firms make money, most of the county firms make money bill by the hour. So, the more your attorney's office, attorneys usually get the bad jokes about it. We don't get it quite as much. Uh, but in order to, for the firm to bring in revenue, you have to track how much time did you spend on this client and which clients are you working on every day. So uh, for me, I track my days in 15 minute increments. And that has blood over into my personal life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, every, every day is 0.25 of an hour. So at the end of my day, then I, 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 do, I do my time daily. A lot of people do it weekly, monthly, but if I don't do it every day, I will forget what I've done. So I input my time every day. Um, I, I usually try to keep it 15 minute increments. I know some people do 10. Some people do six. Yeah, I like six minutes. Yeah, six five. minutes. So so that's uh, mm -hmm. and I'm sure as I my bill rate starts to get higher, I'll probably switch to that. I'm guessing. But um, so that's that's something that I I do. It, it took a lot of time to get used to that. That is, that is a really difficult transition. Um, the best way I think to do it is I, I just try to record it and undo it. Um, the, rarely a day goes by when I leave the office and my time to it. Yeah, we have a time and billing system. So it's up on your screen at all times. So when you work on a client, you get the client the work code. With, so if you were working in tax or audit or whatever, different areas, payroll, and then you put the time, and then some of us will put memos of what we were doing. Um, and that's helpful too. If you if you work for a place that allows you that option, you should always put a memo in. Um, for me, it's because I I don't I do some billing, but I don't do a lot of billing. Like Maggie does a lot of billing, so when she goes back to bill a client that I've worked on, and she sees that I spent two hours on something, she can go in and look and see what exactly I was doing in that two hour time period. She doesn't have to guess. Was I sitting there twiddling my thumbs, you know, reading the internet, or was I actually working? So. She can see what I've done, compare that to my time spent, and determine if that's a reasonable amount of time to do that task. And so, do you have to use that time thing on everything you do within the company? So, if you're doing payroll taxes, you got to keep time on that. Yep. That's how that's how you chart. That's how you know how much time you're spending on. Oh my gosh, that would give me a headache. How many it's, documents that? It's oh. different than it's especially every single day. It's well, it's, you might work on a project for an hour, so you only put the hour in. But I have a tendency to think of six minute increments in my personal life, even, and I think it's because of the time of billing. I'm used to to looking and and writing down my time for everything I do, whether it's administrative. If I do a lot of client development. I have 350 1040 clients that are mine, mm -hmm. and I have almost 200 business clients. Mm -hmm. And so I do billing for all of these clients. My billing and during tax season will take six, seven hours, which I don't have that much time because I have to get these guys. So with other people helping you do different things, you have to add in all of their time, and they have to keep time on everything they're doing within the company. So, for instance, 
Jen might work on a year end one of my business clients, and he might work on a year end. Okay, so he, he might spend eight hours on it, depending on the client. And then I review it. Well, my review process might take 1.3. It depends on how large the business client is and the complexity. And then we've got the tax return team. We have teams that do escort team, partnership team. We have Joe and I have the trust and the state team that specialize in only doing those returns. So while I know how to do an escort return, there's a whole team that does that. So their time goes there. So all of that is in months like today is December 1st. So what's happening today is hopefully everybody got all the timing because not everybody's good about releasing it. And then Marcy, our IT administrator, is posting it and billing will start probably tomorrow or the next day. And so I'm going to get this long list of everybody that's been worked on and this and how much time, and I have to go back through and look and say, okay, usually it's this much for a S corp return. You know, why do I have double? Then, I, you know, sometimes people will put it to the wrong client, like they'll, you type in the name and they put, you know, they accidentally, you might know somebody doesn't work on that client, so we'll have to move the time. And it's a, it's a process. And that's a big difference between entry level and partner too, is that that administration of the billing piece of it and the revenue piece of it from the standpoint. Um, she she has to bill 350 1040s. I only do about 40, so that I'm, I'm in charge of billing. So I'm ramping up more, but that's how you kind of dull and think that it is. I mean, yeah, during tax season, you guys spend a lot of time billing. Yeah. Trying to get that, and our requirement within the firm is that we do it every month. Uh, we require everybody to do their billing every month because if you did not require that, <coughs> that is probably what. It, what do I dislike most? Billing. <laughs> I honestly, I love everything else I do, but billing is the one thing. It's kind of probably like filing when we're in the ministry. <laughs> you got to do it, and you really don't like to do it. But you really do it. Well, that's. When I work in industry, I was one of the things that I didn't like doing. Yeah. Yeah. I asked that because my billing was the worst thing for me to do. I didn't do the billing, but I could see where it was going to go to. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what would happen is I was I would have to put the little OK button on my start screen that says, mm -hmm. "Okay, you're starting your time." I get about 40 minutes into it, and I'm like, oh, "I gotta go to the bathroom." Well, I didn't stop it at that point. And then my boss would come in and re have a review for another client, and I didn't click stop. And all of a sudden, it says an hour and a half. And I haven't been working an hour and a half on that client. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I don't know how long I've been working on it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost a day to struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I still struggle with it, too. Um, at, the, at my level, I get a lot of interruption. Uh, I have a lot of phone calls because I have a lot of needy clients, which I enjoy. Um, so I get a lot of interruptions, and then I'm also training. So I'm training my team. Um, so I, and I have we have 24 people in the firm. So in a given day, I can have at least six or seven. Of course, they're all in an audit, so that gets me all the time. <laughs> yeah, but they'll come in and ask questions or need help with something. So I stop and and have to do that, and and so it's, it gets a little trickier. And then you have clients that just come in, you know, they just drop in. So then you get, you know, you're in the middle of something, your desk is 